my friendship with Nick Rockefeller was one where we were uh, we expressed ideas to each other and thoughts and philosophies, and he wanted me to become part of what they were doing, and for me to become a member of the CFR, and uh, offered various business opportunities for me to get involved in, and for me to um, not take up the fight or the battle that I've been taking up in the past, you know, to drop that idea because what was the point of my fighting for the people, right? So uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family, and he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country, but yet at the same time, we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there, you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do. What everything. You everything is in there. You know? And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them. Everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people, and you become a slave. Uh, I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said, uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And um, he's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told him what the event was going to be. But there was going to be an event. And out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the new world order. And we go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're gonna see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's gonna be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question. He says, there's going to be war and terror. And he's just laughing. 
There's no, <laughs> who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11 who were able to, can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people and to subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And that's why we, and that was the first lie. And the next lie was going into Iraq, an endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never, so you can never define a winner. There's no one who has no one to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. I used to say to them, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need. You have all the power you need. What's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. What, and, and, and I said, all, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, it, most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he, brought, he was at the house one night and uh, we talk, he was talking and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I'm pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote. You know, and he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you wanna know why? He said, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before Women's Lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. It breaks up their family. The, the, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's live, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. ...to worry about Iraq, not Iran. I, I knew why, because I'd been through the Pentagon right after 9-11, about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said, well, don't show it to me. And to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry 
of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, gold today. Um, you know, there's an old saying, worth its weight in gold, which goes back to the fact that early current coins actually were weighed. Um, that's why peso means weight, and the British pound is called the pound, and the lira means pound, which has the same Latin root word as libra, the digital currency that Facebook and others have proposed as well which brings me to, to my point that I want to talk about with Ms. Shelton, um, the need for digital currency to maintain the dollar's primacy in the world. These examples are, are just a few of how throughout history, um, currencies have always had the same um, properties, um, whether they're liquid, they're stable, they're stores of values, they eliminate inefficiencies of bartering. Um, and whether or not we need to add a new property to our currency, namely that it be digital. And to be clear, I'm not talking here about cryptocurrencies or anything like that. I'm talking about a, a central bank digital currency because that's exactly the direction that China intends to go with the digital one. Um, China, like a lot of fragile developing economies, you might say, needs digital currencies primarily internally because they don't have the kind of institutions that we have, whether that institution is the dollar, whether the institution is the Federal Reserve, or simply the rule of law and rights of property and contract. Uh, for the United States, we need the digital currency a little bit less, I would argue, internally, but rather to help preserve the primacy of the dollar worldwide. Um, so for instance, China um, has wide-scale use of uh, digital payment systems inside of China, but they hope to use the digital one uh, worldwide to replace the dollar as the reserve currency. With all of the economic benefits that that brings to the, to the United States, and especially the security benefits it brings to enforce sanctions. So just to use an, an example, um, China buys a lot of agricultural products from Argentina. They don't contract those and transact in pesos or in yuan, but in dollars, which again gives us uh, great leverage. Uh, in enforcing our sanctions worldwide. Um, it, if we do not move to add digitization to the dollar as a feature of those timeless historical properties of currency, I worry a lot that a digital one could ultimately replace the reserve currency, just as we re replaced the pound in the last century. So, Ms. Shelton, could you talk to us a little bit about what you on the Federal Reserve Board and what the Federal Reserve as a whole could do to help protect the dollar's reserve currency and especially um, address the need to have digitization as a potential property of the dollar? Thank you, Senator Cotton. Um, I think that's an extremely important discussion. And, uh, and I agree with your assessment. I think we're compelled to think about that. The dollar is the most important instrument of soft power that we have around the world. And yes, it is the dominant reserve currency, but we can't rest on our laurels in that regard because as, as you suggested, rival nations are working very diligently to have an alternative to the dollar. And while they can't beat us as, as a currency, they can add features because there is a demand for digital access to banking services, to payments, and I think it's very important that we get ahead of the curve to ensure that the dollar offers, continues to offer the best currency in the world, the most respected, uh, the most utilized, and we need a FinTech innovation to keep us going in the right direction and to be a leader instead of um, 
passively observing what other countries might do. Setting microchips under their skin. It means they may never have to carry a house key, train ticket or bank card ever again. This is a microchipping party. And applause, this. Yeah. Hannah's getting an electronic chip implanted into her hand. She believes one day we'll all be chipped like her. So congratulations, Hannah. Thank you. You've been chipped? Yes, I have. How does it feel? It feels good. I'm, I'm excited to see what I'll be able to do now. Can I touch it? Yeah, you can, you can feel it there. 